Is everybody able to see the screen there? All right, great. Yes, you can see it. So we'll get started here. Um, so I thank everybody for coming. Obviously, this is a little bit different for everyone doing a, a virtual lecture, but this is the times that we're living in and uh, what we need to do. So um, again, appreciate you coming. And if you do have questions, you know, we'll try to get them answered. Um, if we can't get them answered in the time we have, um, Casey can help to coordinate. You know, we can get back to you through email, through phone calls, things like that as well. Um, and then we can always set up appointments if anybody wants to come in and talk about anything in more detail specific to them. Um, so we're going to talk about what's new in hip replacement today. Um, and so when we go there, we got to start back and talk what is a hip replacement. And so there's different terms that people may hear that are thrown around out there. Uh, people may hear about a total hip replacement, a partial hip replacement, and hip resurfacing or some of the terms that come up. And when we talk about a total hip replacement, you'll see the picture on the uh, left side of, or your right side of the screen, um, which shows the stem, the ball, the cup, and the liner. And that's a traditional hip replacement that we utilize now for a total hip where we're replacing both the ball side and the cup side. If you look at the picture on the bottom left, um, that's going to be what's called a hip resurfacing. And so that's where just the ball is resurfaced, not the whole down into the shaft of the stem. And then the cup is the same as for the total hip replacement where the cup side is, is resurfaced as well. And then a partial hip replacement, um, which is just doing the ball side and leaving the cup alone. Um, for a partial hip replacement, that's typically done when we look at fracture surgery. So someone falls and breaks their hip, the cup side is still good, but the ball side is not. That's where we look at partial hip replacement, not utilized for arthritic problems, because if you only address one side, the other arthritic side will still be a problem. Um, for hip resurfacing, these were big a uh, number of years back, but have kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, we ran into problems in terms of um, the bearing surfaces, and we're going to talk about bearing surfaces later, but this has a metal on metal articulation, and so all but one company in the United States have pulled their hip resurfacing from the market. So really not something that's done uh, too frequently in the U.S. anymore. Still some, some people still do them, but for the most part not. So we're going to focus on, on total hip replacement today. So when we look at it radiographically here, uh, the x-ray on the left side of the screen is someone who has hip arthritis in both of their hips. Um, can you see the pointer on your screens? Yes. Okay. So when we, when we look here, this is the ball of the ball and socket joint. And then on the other side is the socket. And so there should be a nice space between those two, but there isn't in either hip. And we have big extra growths of bone coming off both above and below. And so this is someone who has significant arthritis in both of their hips. Arthritis is that loss of cartilage. And so as that space gets more and more narrowed, we talk about the progression of arthritis. And when someone completely loses that space, as this person has, we talk about bilateral total uh, end stage arthritis. Um, on the picture on the right, you can see now where we've gone and we've done a hip replacement on the first side. And so now we've put a new cup inside with a few screws to give it initial fixation. The stem going down within the bone and then a ball sitting on top of that stem. Inside that cup will sit the liner, and we'll go into more about these terms in a little bit, um, but the ball and the liner are the two surfaces that will move back and forth, and the two implants attached to the body are going to be moving. So when we look at the design of the implants, these have changed significantly over the years, although some of the techniques are still utilized. And so when we look at the stem side first that goes down inside the thigh bone, we talk about cemented and cementless options. And so the first two images here in the picture are both cemented options. And you can see that the implants themselves are smooth. They don't have a roughened surface. The one on the left side has what's called a collar that sits at the top of the bone. The other one does not. Again, differences in just the implant's design. These types of implants were the ones that were originally utilized by Sir John Charlie, who's the father of hip replacement. Um, and so, you know, they've been tried and true. They've worked in Europe. They're the um, standard in terms of hip replacement implants. Um, however, in the U.S., we've started to grow upon that, and we've gone towards more of a cementless fixation option now if someone has the appropriate bone quality for that. And so the images on the far side of the screen all demonstrate different types of cementless implants, and you can see that their implants have these textured portions to them. And those textured portions are what allows the bone to grow into it 
And that's actually what gives it that long-term fixation rather than the cement. The benefits of a cementless over a cemented implant is that if we can get your bone to grow in it, the potential for much longer fixation versus cement can wear over time under the stresses that it goes through. Um, we then also will talk about the cup options. And when we talk about the cups, we do have both cemented and cementless cups. However, the gold standard is a cementless cup. Um, cemented cups were originally utilized but had a very high failure rate. Cement does its best job in compression, not on uh, shear forces. So on the cup side, we see a lot more shear, which can lead to earlier loosening. So in, in almost all cases, unless we can't get the bone to grow in, we use a cementless. And you can see different options of the cups here, where we have this, again, surface on the back side that if you looked close under a microscope, it actually looks like a sponge where the bone actually will grow into it. Some options will have screw holes through them, again, where we can put some screws to aid in that initial fixation. When we look at the liners, the original liners that were put in that were actually cemented, um, and then the original ones that were put in inside the cementless cups were made of polyethylene, which is a surgical grade plastic. Um, that surgical grade plastic acts essentially as your new cartilage and allows the ball to move along a nice smooth surface. When these were utilized, these were lasting around 10 years and then they were starting to wear. And so when we started to see that people were coming back around the 10 year mark, we said, okay, can we get better at making these hips last longer? And so we came out then with ceramic liners. And so ceramic liners were then utilized because we found that the amount that the ceramic would wear was a lot less. Unfortunately, we found there were issues with ceramic. And one of the biggest issues that we found that people disliked was they would squeak at times. And so as someone would be walking down the hall, people would hear them coming because the hip would be squeaking and they didn't care for that too much. And so we tended to shy away from putting in the ceramic options because of that, because of the hard on hard surface squeaking. We then tried to utilize metal bearings. And so we found that the metal had a good coefficient of friction and putting the metal on metal tended to create less wear particles However, the problem that we found when trying to use the metal on metal was that the body reacted very poorly to that metal debris that did become created and would actually be destructive to the tissue around it. And so that's, again, in part why hip resurfacing has gone by the wayside is because it was a metal on metal bearing. And so these have all been discontinued throughout the U.S. And so we said, okay, well, you know, we've gotten to this point. We're trying to figure out how to make it better. And then we looked around and said, our cell phones are better plastic, our TV remotes are better plastic, our cars are better plastic, why not make better plastic for the implants? And so we're now actually on a third generation of a plastic liner. And when we take it to the lab and we cycle it back and forth, the amount that that wears is a whole lot less than the first generation. And when we're seeing people back at seven and at 10 years for their follow-ups after their hip replacement with these new liners, they're actually looking like the day that we put them in. So it's very positive signs in terms of the potential that these implants could last longer. Oftentimes people will ask, how long will they last? And the true answer is we won't know until we can look back in time and, and really tell because the body can react differently as we've learned over the years, rather than simply how things last in the lab. But in the lab, it's shown us that these implants could last a long, long time. So, you know, really time will tell. The other option that we have that's been created um, is what's called a dual mobility option. And this is an option that we typically utilize um, in revision settings, um, sometimes in the primary setting if we have someone that's gonna be at a high risk for dislocation or the ball popping out of the cup. And this construct actually utilizes two balls. And so you can see there's a small ball on the inside and a large ball on the outside, and then the cup with its liner. And so this construct allows the large ball to move first, and when that reaches its maximum limit, then the small ball actually can move inside of that. And so that can allow for larger distances of motion before that risk for dislocation. Why this hasn't become the gold standard yet in terms of hip replacement is that we don't have as long of a track record on it as we do with the standard um, plastic liner and then ceramic or metal head. And so because of that, we haven't gone and adopted that as the standard, but when we have someone who's considered a higher risk, we do tend to utilize it. Um, for the heads, there are both metal and ceramic heads that are utilized. Uh, in my practice, uh, most patients uh, will end up receiving a ceramic head uh, because of the better wear characteristics against the plastic liner. Uh, there are some 
sizes that don't come in ceramic. And so those would need to be metal, which again, has a good track record going out, you know, a number of years. Um, but again, we, you know, our standard at this point is the plastic on the ceramic of the two surfaces. And then the implants that are attached to the bone are made of titanium. And frequently people will ask, you know, if these are made of metal, will they set off the alarms as I go through the airport or as I go through security stations? And oftentimes they will. They don't always, and it depends on the sensitivity of the uh, testing, but you may notice as you go through the airport, they frequently will ask, they say, does anyone have any replacements? Does that anyone have any metal inside them? And everyone will go through the scanner and they'll wand you down and they'll, you know, they'll see that it lights up in that region. But, um, you know, years ago we gave people cards that said, oh, I had my hip replaced by Dr. Sizer and this is what's inside. And now because of the frequency of it and the ability for anybody to make a card like that, you know, now it's, it's just become commonplace for people to be scanned as they go through. When we talk about surgical approaches, there's many different ways to do a hip replacement. And we talk about the posterior approach, which is an incision that's made at the back portion of the hip. We talk about a lateral incision or an anterior lateral incision that's made along the side of the hip. And an anterior approach that's made in the front of the hip. And when we look at this diagram here, this is a cadaveric picture here, but where we have the ball of the ball and socket joint and the cup is on this side. And the top is the front portion or the anterior side of the patient and the back is the posterior or bottom side of the patient. And this is looking at the left hip on this side here. When we look at these, we can see there are many different ways to get into the hip joint to do the operation. But what I think is interesting is when you look at all these different approaches, we have the anterior approach, the anterior lateral, the lateral, the direct lateral, and the posterior. A lot of these approaches, which sometimes people will deem new approaches to the, to the hip replacement, you know, was originally described by Smith-Peterson in 1917. So these aren't necessarily new approaches. They oftentimes will have uh, an invigoration sometimes where, you know, the market tends to advertise them a little more and we talk about, you know, quicker recoveries, better recoveries. And at the end of the day, what we know when we look at large studies to say, you know, is there a best approach to the hip? And there really aren't market differences between the two or between the four. And so when we look at that and we say, you know, the real key is having the operation done well by a skilled surgeon who does that operation well. If you either have the operation done poorly by a surgeon who doesn't know what they're doing, it doesn't matter what approach they're, they're going through. And so really we don't see market differences. Um, with my practice, I do both the anterior and the posterior approach, and I try to risk stratify each person as to what operation is best for them. Uh, some people only do one approach, uh, but I think that trying to maximize the individualization or the customization for each person is really important. So that's where you know, I use both approaches um, and pick what's best for each person. One of the biggest things that we've created uh, probably over the last five years has been a rapid recovery protocol. And that's where we've seen the biggest changes in terms of outcomes. And so this starts in the office. And I think preoperative education is one of the biggest aspects that we can do to help people in terms of their recovery. And so giving knowledge is absolute power. And everybody who's here today learning about what's new in hip replacement is, is empowering themselves in part of their potential path if they end up undergoing hip replacement to that recovery. And so I spend a lot of time in the office going over what to expect before surgery, what to expect during surgery, and what to expect after surgery. And everyone who leaves my office ready for hip replacement receives a booklet on hip replacement that goes through a lot about what we talked about in the office and more. And so it gives them that opportunity to go back and look and say, what did we talk about in terms of driving? What did we talk about in terms of length of stay? You know, and then also share that with their loved ones and those people that are going to be helping them afterwards, because it's key to have everyone in unison attacking this, you know, from all angles. That way we're able to have the best recovery. Um, one of the next aspects has been our pain recovery. And this starts actually in the preoperative area. And so when people come in for surgery, even before they go back to the operating room, they're already getting medications given to them to help prevent the pain before it begins. And we found that that can make a big difference rather than waiting until the pain sets in and trying to treat it afterwards. And we're trying to use what's called an opioid sparing type of recovery where we're not giving someone opioids the entire time of their recovery, trying to just attack it from one avenue. Instead, we're trying to use other options that we can. And so we use different standing medications that are non-opioid based to begin. And then that translates into the operating room where then we use what's called a spinal anesthetic. 
And so for over 90% of my patients, they have a spinal anesthetic where they receive an injection into the back. It numbs them up from the waist down so that they don't feel anything during the surgery. And then they're given medication through an IV to put them into a twilight sleep so that they're comfortable and unaware of what's going on during the surgery. This allows for less post-op nausea and vomiting. It allows for less blood loss during the surgery. There's lower risk of blood clots. There's lower risk of heart attack and stroke. And so in patients that are able to tolerate a spinal anesthetic, it's really been a, a significant game changer rather than general anesthesia. If someone needs general anesthesia, we still can utilize that. If either they're you know, medically unfit for it, if their back has you know, significant back surgeries in the past, um, or if they choose not to, you know, we can utilize those, but spinal anesthesia has been a, a significant improvement uh, for this rapid recovery protocol. Um, another aspect has been early mobilization. And so years ago, we treated people who had hip replacements like they were sick. And we said, no, 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 don't get up, don't move, you know, I'll get that for you, stay there. And what we found was that we were actually causing more problems and more issues by not allowing people to be up. So now you can see in this picture here, right, this woman after her hip replacement is up in the recovery room, right? So she hasn't even gone down to her room yet and she's already up and moving. And so while this isn't common necessarily to have someone up in the recovery room, we do try to get someone up as soon as possible. And so as soon as their spinal anesthetic is worn off, we like to get our therapy team in there and get them moving. We don't want your body to know that it just had this big operation, right? The more you're moving, the, the less of a risk of blood clots, the rest, less risk for pneumonia, the less risk for bed sores. All of those things are gonna optimize your body in terms of its recovery. While we do focus on early mobilization, we then also need to focus on ice and elevation. So it's the balance between the two of taking the time to do the activities to be up and moving, but then also treating this as an area that just had a major operation. And so we need to make sure we're taking time to elevate our feet, taking time to put ice around that region and get that area to calm down. Because as we get the swelling down and as we get the pain to improve with utilization of things like ice, that can help again in our recovery pathway. And then utilizing this post-operative multimodal pain regimen. And so again, we use standing acetaminophen. So I use a thousand milligrams every eight hours, whether someone feels like they need it or not for the first few weeks to give a baseline. As long as they can tolerate it, we use it, uh, an anti-inflammatory, both IV and oral while they're in the hospital, and then oral upon discharge. We utilize a steroid, uh, both in the operating room and then the first day after surgery, again, as long as their medical conditions can tolerate it. And then we do have uh, a local anesthetic that's given into the tissues at the time of surgery as well. With all of these things, we've found that there's a decreased reliance on narcotic pain medicines. However, it doesn't mean that there's zero reliance on it. And so we do still have those as options where we have both a mild and a moderate narcotic pain medicine that are available for people if they need it. And I found that most patients may require a few of the tablets in the first few weeks after surgery. Most patients between two and four weeks are completely off them. And I do have a large number of people who come back and say they never took any of them, that they utilize the anti-inflammatories and the Tylenol, and they did great. And that's fantastic. The one thing I always caution people on is, as long as you're able to be up and moving, I'm fine without utilizing the narcotic medicine. But if someone says their pain control is great, but they can't get up out of bed because they're too sore, right, then they may need a little help and a little assistance, you know, again, even if it's for that first week or so. These factors have really aided in terms of the recovery for, for people. Um, one of the other things that we have changed is historically, we did aggressive physical therapy for everyone after surgery. And what we found was that more people were coming back with more swelling and more soreness around their hips because they were doing so well, the therapists were trying to advance them to the next level, next level, the same way they do you know, from a sports recovery. And this is very different than a sports operation or than a sports injury that someone's rehabbing. And we really do need to let this calm down. And so what we found was that by saying simply be up, walk around, live everyday life, We've had an easier recovery, less pain, less swelling, and less of these tendonitis type pictures. And people have really done fantastic in terms of their recovery. And if we find that at any point during their recovery that they needed therapy, then that's always there. Because if someone's struggling at six weeks or at three months or at six years, we can always add that in, but we've given the hip time to let it calm down and let it recover at that point. So some of the technologies that we've started to utilize and started to see uh, in the field of hip replacement um, are intraoperative x-ray or fluoroscopy, robotic assisted surgery, and then patient specific guides. And so the first picture here on the right demonstrates an intraoperative fluoroscopic image. 
And so we're, we're using essentially a, a real-time x-ray to take a picture of someone's implant as we're putting them into the joint. And this allows us to make real-time adjustments to the positioning of the implant to make sure that they're perfect in terms of their alignment, to make sure that our positioning of the length of the hip is correct, the offset or lateral positioning of the hip is correct, and allows us really to hone in our technique. Um, the other robotic assisted surgery, so when we look at robotic assisted surgery, this is where we preoperatively utilize a CT scan to get a digital image of the knee or the hip itself. And then what we do is we map out the surgery. And this allows us to plan with the operation of the operational arm for the robot in order to put the implants in the position that we're hoping to put them in. Um, these tools at this point are geared a little bit towards surgeons who don't necessarily do a lot of hip and knee replacement and are trying to get them to be able to recreate what fellowship trained joint surgeons can do repeatedly, which is trying to again put those implants in the perfect position every time. And so when we looked at these to see, can these change the outcomes, whether we're using the intraoperative fluoroscopy, the robotic assisted or the patient specific guides, we haven't seen any change in terms of outcomes yet. We haven't seen that people have had improvements in their pain. We haven't seen longer lasting implants. We haven't seen quicker recoveries, but they are tools to be able to potentially utilize, again, to try to hit that spot time and time again. When we look at patient-specific guides, again, another tool that we can utilize to try to pinpoint based on that person's anatomy, where should we make our cuts? Where should we smooth out the bone on the cuff side to try to put this implant in perfect for this person? And so while these guides and these robotic assistances can be great and can be wonderful things to utilize, you need to make sure that you know how to use them because the machines are only as smart as we tell them. And so, right, if you tell your car to drive right into the water, it's going to drive right into the water, right? So you need to make sure that you know what it's doing and how that feedback is going to play into your hand because there are times where these things can be off and they can be miscalibrated and they can be miscalculated and the surgeon needs to make sure that they know how to adjust to that, how to manipulate that in order to still have the perfect outcome for that person. And so while these technologies are growing and while these technologies are starting to become more and more common throughout the country, we need to make sure that we're seeing them utilized well and that they're actually able to reproduce the outcomes that we're expecting from them. Um, they do often add cost um, to the overall you know, um, care, um, and so it's something that we do need to make sure that we're looking at when we do it, that, you know, are we doing what's best for you in terms of outcomes, um, in terms of getting you to have the, the best hip replacement possible. With outcomes, when we look at hip replacement surgery, we do have excellent success. So we have 90 to 95% good to excellent outcomes when we look at hip replacement surgery. And this is rated by both physicians and patients. And there's very little, almost if anything in medicine that comes anywhere close to that 90 to 95% mark. And so it's something that you know, clearly we've, we've developed and clearly we've made into an excellent operation, yet we're still striving to become even better. Um, the survivorship is also excellent. You know, we look at hip replacement surgery being a very common operation. Um, the average age is probably around 64 years of age in the United States right now. Um, but we're doing them in, in people even in their 20s. Um, even in their teens at times if they have you know post-traumatic arthritis or other forms of arthritis that you know set in earlier for them um, and even in those people we've seen you know excellent survivorship so far so you know a very positive operation um, a lot to you know to, to look forward to as we move into this you know new generation of, of hip replacements and technologies um, and i appreciate everybody coming today and, and their time being here moment to look at some of the questions. All right. Um, a couple of questions did come through here. Um, the first one is, which hip replacement approach approaches cut the muscles and which ones do not? Sure. So great question. So when we look at the approaches, um, the anterior approach is considered um, a muscle splitting approach. And so we're going between an interval of two muscles in order to split them apart, in order to get down to the hip. Um, frequently with the anterior approach, um, there are uh, some ligamentous releases that are done in order to get the hip up and out of the wound in order to put the femoral component in. Um, so there are some tendinous releases that are done at that time. Um, with the posterior approach, the gluteus maximus, which is our big buttock muscle, 
is uh, the fibers of it are split apart as well in order to gain access. And then again, ligamentous releases are performed. Um, with the anterior lateral and the lateral approach, uh, the abductor muscles, which are a big set of muscles on the side of our hip, are elevated and are removed from the bone in order to gain access to the hip. Um, and then those are tacked back down. So, you know, while at times we may see and hear that, you know, there's approaches that are completely muscle sparing, none of them really completely avoid it, but there are ways for us to, to gain access to the hip that may be a little more muscle friendly. Um, but, but again, all approaches in terms of outcomes um, can be, you know, um, excellent outcomes as long as they're done well by a good surgeon. Thank you. Uh, next question is, how do you check for leg lengths to avoid leg length differences? Yeah, so good question. So when we do that, there are multiple ways. And the, the way it begins is actually in the office. And so when someone comes into the office, we're going to go ahead and examine them. And so we want to check and see what are their lengths. Um, and so, you know, I, I try to be very thorough with everyone who comes in and I have people get changed into gowns. Um, I have everyone take off their socks and shoes. You know, we have them lie down on the table so we can examine you, we can check your pulses. And then also I do an assessment of where your lengths are. And then we also can look at them radiographically and see where they are. But one of the biggest factors that I do for everyone that I see for a hip replacement is ask them how they feel preoperatively. Because most people, when we look at that ball and socket joint, have lost space in that hip. But it's happened over such a gradual period of time that most people don't notice a difference between the two. And so even though they may be a few millimeters off before the operation, they feel exactly equal. And with the operation, when we put that ball back into place where it should be, I always let people know they may feel long in the early stages. And that's completely normal for almost everybody. They'll feel a little bit long in the beginning. And by the time they get to six to 12 weeks, the body will tend to level out one side to the other. And most people then won't notice that difference between the two. Intraoperatively, we check again when you're on the operating room table, again, to see where your lengths are. And we measure and we say, okay, where are we? Are we short? Are we long? Are we equal? And then as we put the implants in, again, we're measuring where are we from start to finish. I also check when I remove the top portion of the ball that comes out. When we put the replacement in, there's pieces that we put on top to recreate that. And I'm actually able to line those up and see is the amount that we took out, the exact amount that we are putting back. And that's if someone feels equal and is equal ahead of time. But if someone is short or someone is long, right, then we're going to make try to make those assessments in the operating room to make sure that they're equal afterwards. The biggest and most important thing in the operating room, however, is stability to the hip. And so once the trial pieces are all in place, I take the hip through a range of motion to make sure that it's stable and not at an increased risk for popping out of place. And so if someone's hip has that instability to it once the implants are in place, Sometimes we actually intentionally have to make someone longer in order to give them that stability. And so obviously that's going to trump, you know, at the end of the day to make sure that their legs are, are stable rather than equal if need be. But again, even if we have to increase, and again, we're talking millimeters here, you know, most people by, by six to 12 weeks don't notice the difference. Between them. Thank you. Next question. Um, how will I know it's time for a hip replacement? I've been told I have, um, arthritic hips, um, but still seem to be okay. Um, hold on. But still seems okay while I have great pain in my muscles and tendons on my left side with a limited range of motion. So hip replacement surgery is going to be an individualized timing. And so what I mean by that is, you know, we need to see multiple things coming together to know that someone's ready for hip replacement. And so when I look at an x-ray, I'm going to look to see, has someone worn that space down towards where they're near, not everyone's directly bone on bone yet, but where they're near bone on bone arthritis. And when we see that significant loss of space, we know that that person radiographically would benefit from a hip replacement. But then we want to make sure that we're combining that with symptoms. And so when we see someone, if they have bone on bone arthritis and their primary care doctor sent them to me, and I say, how are you doing? How are you feeling? And they say, I'm great. You know, I'm a mailman. I deliver the mail every day. I walk around. My hip doesn't bother me. Just because they have arthritis on x-ray doesn't mean they need a hip replacement. And I say, okay. I say, if your hip starts bothering you, come on back and we'll talk more. And the reverse is true, that if someone comes in to see me and says, I have terrible pain, I can't walk, I can't move, I can't do anything, and I get an x-ray and they have perfect space and no arthritis, that person also doesn't need a hip replacement. You know, we need to figure out why they have that pain but they also don't need a hip replacement. 
And so we want to see the marrying of the two, that someone has the arthritic changes on x-ray, and then they also have the symptoms. And those symptoms that we look for are, you know, disruptions in your quality of life, right? So we want to see that someone, you know, has tried medications, they've tried to modify their activity, you know, they've tried potentially doing some therapeutic exercises, um, they've tried to lose weight, they've tried to stay healthy, and all of these factors have come together and really have failed to provide them any significant relief. And they note that going up and down the stairs is becoming challenging. Getting in and out of the car is challenging. A lot of people will say, you know, yeah, when I'm getting in the car, I lift my leg and kind of toss it in in order to get my leg in. You know, that tells me that, yeah, that hip is becoming more painful for them. They're, they're suffering in terms of their quality of life. And that's where then we look at, at replacement surgery. Dr. Seid, your definition of an excellent outcome? So my definition of an excellent outcome um, is from the physician side, I want to make sure the radiographs are perfect, right? So I want to make sure that the cup is in good position, the stem is in good position, there's good ingrowth from both of the components. That is radiographically a good outcome. And then from the patient side of it, I want to make sure that they've returned their quality of life and that their pain has greatly improved. And so we know that there can be multiple reasons why someone can have pain around the hip joint. It can be from the hip itself. It can be from tendons. It can be from ligaments. It can be from the spine. Um, they could have hernias. They can have other reasons. So there's other reasons potentially to have it. But what we note is that the, that deep aching groin pain that people are just kind of nagged by over and over and over from their hip arthritis is usually markedly improved, if not gone, even when they wake up from surgery. And they'll be sore from the surgery itself, but they'll note you know, a significant improvement. And then we want to see that they're getting back to those other activities that they want to. And so if someone likes to garden or someone likes to hike or someone wants to swim and they've been restricted by that because of their hip, that they're able to get back to those activities. And I think it's really important to know what our expectations are ahead of time, because that's sometimes where we see people that aren't as satisfied with their joint replacement is the person that thinks that maybe their hip is going to be the one they had when they were 20 years old and they're going to be able to run and play basketball and you know and do these high impact type of exercises and afterwards they may not be able to and we recommend that they avoid high impact type of exercise and so if that person in their mind was expecting that right they may be less satisfied with that that outcome um, as compared to a, a an excellent outcome that we may see where they're able to walk without pain they walk without a limp um, they don't need an assistive device anymore you know they're they're up and they're picking up their grandchildren and they're playing and they're doing all those things right to me that that's where that excellent outcome comes Thank you. We're going to have to keep these answers a little short because we have quite a few questions coming in. Sure. How many hip replacements have you done? So I do a couple hip, a couple hundred hip replacements a year. Um, you know, so it's it's been in the you know uh, hundreds. Uh, I don't know if we're in thousands yet um, of, of hip replacements over the course of my career. Thanks. If you've already had one hip replaced and need the other one done, would you suggest the same approach regarding where to cut? Uh, I think that that's oftentimes can be useful. Um, you know, I think that if someone's had a good outcome one way, it can be nice to, to do it the same way, um, but it doesn't need to be. And I've had people that I've seen um, who have had one approach and they had a poor outcome. They had significant blood loss, they had wound issues, they had blood clots, they had a lot of different problems all at once with the one surgery. And they came and saw me for another and they said, well, will you do it from that same approach again? And I said, well, you had so many issues and so many problems from the first time. And I didn't think they were a good candidate to have it done that way, whether it was the first side or the second side. And so I recommended for them to have it done a different way. And they had it done the other way and they had no significant blood loss. Uh, they had no blood clots. They didn't develop an infection. Their joint is wonderful and, and functioning well. And so for that person, I thought that they should go a different route. And so again, at the end of the day, you know, having it done well, whether it's from, you know, any approach, um, really, in my mind, is it isn't the biggest issue. Okay, next question. Um, hip replacement was done in 2005 with ceramic and titanium. How long are you finding these types of replacements to last? So, again, we're, you know, what we're looking at now, you know, from a 2005 standpoint, um, it, it may be a, the, they had ceramic on titanium. They probably had titanium and then ceramic is, my guess is ceramic on polyethylene would be my guess. Um, so if we're looking at that, again, you know, we don't really know, but, you know, we're hoping, can we get 15, you know, years out of that hip replacement? Could we get more? Yes. 
Um, and you know, one of the important things to do if you had your hip replaced at that time is to continue to follow it. So I usually, once we get to the one year mark, I see people every five years after that um, to keep an eye on it. And so, you know, that's where we want to make sure that we're looking at it and saying, okay, you know, let's, let's follow and make sure we're not wearing it out. Let's make sure we're not seeing the implant loosening from the bone. Um, and so, you know, that's um, an important thing I think to do. Um, and then I see the, the ceramic ever breaking um, with falls. And so can we break the implants? You could. Um, more likely if someone were to have a fall, they would probably break the bone around the implant because that's likely going to be the weaker link between the two. Um, but it is possible to break the implant. Okay. What's the difference in recovery between staples and glue? So no difference in terms of the speed of recovery. Um, I use glue in my practice. I don't care for staples. I think that cosmetically, um, in my mind, glue leaves a better result. I also don't like drainage from incisions. And with staple, you can still have drainage through there. So I like a watertight seal. Um, the glue also acts as the bandage. Um, and it's also not something that needs to be taken out, which sometimes can be a little uncomfortable to have the staples or, uh, or sutures removed. Um, so I use glue in my practice, but no difference in terms of speed of recovery. Great. What restrictions will the patient experience after recovery from a hip re replacement? So what we recommend is avoiding that high impact, so repetitive loading type of exercises. Um, and so it's anything essentially that involves running. Um, so running purely for exercise, uh, basketball, lacrosse, football, soccer, things where you're repetitively loading on the joint. We recommend you stop because there's the potential for either wearing that implant out sooner or loosening it from the bone. Um, lower impact type of exercises such as swimming, cycling, walking, hiking, uh, golf, tennis, um, surfing, skiing, all of those things are fine to get back to doing. It's just more that repetitive high impact loading. Any post-op precautions needed in terms of ADLs? Um, so in the early stages, we do have some cautions. Um, one of the biggest that I will tell people um, is that they need to listen to their hip. And what that means is when they're moving in any, any sort of motion postoperatively, if they start to feel a barrier when they're bending forward to tie their shoes or pick something up off the ground, that wherever they meet that barrier, their body may tell them, okay, that's where I'm at in terms of my mobility at this point. Don't try to push past it or bounce past it. Because those people that do try to push past or bounce past may run into issues in those early stages. Um, and that's for the first six weeks after surgery. Yeah. Uh, if warranted, do you recommend replacing both hips in one session? I don't typically. Um, usually I will do one at a time, as you saw in that x-ray that I had up there, you know, doing one and then coming back and doing the other typically around three months afterwards. Um, the physical toll on the body tends to be significantly greater uh, with doing them both at the same time. Um, the risk for blood clots is higher, um, so I usually will do one at a time. Okay. Is it normal to still have some pain while sleeping three years after surgery? So uh, some people do tend to find this, um, you know, when they lie on that side. Uh, I see it in my practice more commonly in people who have um, less soft tissue at the side of the hip. Um, just because the, you know, if you feel that side of the hip, that bump of bone that sits out there tends to be pretty superficial. And so if we don't have some padding in that region, it can still be sore. So even three years after, some people will still find it. Most don't, most get back to lying on that side, but it's, it's not uncommon to see, especially in pretty thin patients. Okay. Um, there was a hip replacement in 2011. What, if the ball and socket wears, what would a replacement for those parts look like? So if someone simply was wearing out the plastic insert that was on the socket side, um, the surgery is a relatively easier operation uh, for someone undergoing that um, because we're simply going in, it's more of a soft tissue operation. When we're going in, we're opening up the hip capsule again, we're removing that plastic liner, putting a new liner in place, and then putting a new ball on top. Um, and so it's a, a much smaller operation. There's no bony work that needs to be done if it's simply wearing the, wearing the liner. Okay. Do you test to see if, per, if a person may be sensitive to materials being used? So we don't. So we did years ago, we were testing people and we were, you know, asking, do you have allergies to metals? Um, and what we found in, in working with our allergist physicians um, is that there isn't the same correlation to metal implanted in the body that there is from a skin testing standpoint. 
Um, so the current recommendation from the Orthopedic Academy, as well as from the allergists, um, is to no longer metal test uh, because we haven't seen that correlation. Do you have to tourniquet the leg? So for a hip replacement, we do not put a tourniquet on the leg. Uh, for where the surgery is, it's above the level um, of where a tourniquet could be utilized, so we do not tourniquet the leg. Okay. Uh, what are, um, besides pain, what are some of the symptoms cause, that come with hip arthritis? Well, well, one of the common, and we'll just talk about pain, um, is that most people when they experience pain will actually feel it in the groin. So there's a lot of people that will come in that you know thought they pulled their groin, they thought they you know strained a muscle, they've been you know putting topical creams on it, they've been icing it, they've been stretching, they saw their you know therapist, they went to the sports doctor, and then they found out ultimately that they had hip arthritis. So the groin is actually the most common area. Um, people, some people will feel it on the outside part of their hip and some in the buttock, uh, but again, the most common is going to be the groin. And then as we talked about earlier, you know the symptoms that people will have are frequently difficulty getting dressed, socks and shoes, going up and down the stairs, in and out of the car. Those are gonna be some of the most common ones that we'll see. Okay. Why is the typical protocol for recovery walking 10 minutes every hour and no physical therapy? So as we talked about before, you know, it's that gentle recovery process. When we do that aggressive therapy early on, we tend to see more inflammation, more swelling, more of a tendonitis-like picture in people coming back. Um, so that's why we've gone away from that formal physical therapy. Okay. Um, is there an exercise you can recommend you can recommend to alleviate pain caused by arthritis? So some of the best are going to be, you know, well, one is going to be individualized for each person, but some of the best exercises are going to be those low impact aerobic exercises. Um, so elliptical, swimming, uh, bicycling, whether it's stationary um, or outside are going to be some of the best exercises to, to try to do in order to keep the joint loose and avoid that high impact. Um, each person's going to find what works for them. Somebody may get on the bicycle and it may make it worse. Other people may get on the elliptical and it makes it worse. So you got to try to find what works for you. Um, but low impact aerobic are going to be the best. Swimming obviously is essentially a no impact type of exercise, uh, but not everybody has access to pools. Okay. Is there a specific BMI necessary to be an acceptable candidate? So there is. So we know when we look at BMI, which is the height compared to someone's weight, that there is a dramatic increase in complications if someone's BMI is over 40. And so in my practice and as a whole in Rothman, um, we do have a specific indication that we need to see that BMI less than 40. And when we look at that, we, I look at it the same way I do as if someone had diabetes or someone had clogged arteries in their heart. Right? We need to make sure that they are medically optimized, make sure they have a good outcome. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's why we have that, that for you. What is the prognosis of a downhill skier after having a hip replacement? So people can absolutely get back to, to downhill skiing. Um, you know, I usually will recommend that they avoid moguls, um, but they can absolutely get back to skiing. Skiing is definitely by nature going to be a riskier activity than walking. Um, but, you know, they can absolutely do it, you know, pre-hip replacement, they can fall and, and injure something as well. So, you know, it, the, the nature of the sport doesn't change, but they can absolutely do it after. Great. Okay. Couple more. How many, how much acetaminophen can be tolerated daily, um, which is safe to alleviate discomfort or pain yes. caused by arthritic, by the arthritic hip? So the current recommendation is 3,000 milligrams in a day. Um, and so that's why I utilize the 1,000 milligrams, which is two of the extra strength tablets, three times a day um, that people can utilize either before surgery or after surgery. Okay. Would it be uncommon to have two different surgeries complete two hip replacements? Um, everybody's different in, in what they're going to choose or who they're going to choose. And so I've taken care of people who have had one hip replaced in Florida and then they moved up here and then I did their other side or from Alaska and then moved here. So you know, it, it, it's not uncommon for us to see that. Um, I think that if someone had a good operation, they had a good outcome, and they had a good experience with that surgeon, I think that relationship is really important. Um, and so, you know, potentially seeing that person again, um, but it doesn't need to be, you know, whether someone had a bad experience, a bad outcome, or they, you know, moved, uh, it's not unreasonable to see a different surgeon for the replacement. Okay. Um, does chocolate therapy help before you need surgery? 
So aqua therapy can be a nice way to continue to keep your joint moving um, before surgery. The, it doesn't necessarily alter the eventual you know, degenerative process of arthritis, but it is a good way to stay active. Um, and staying active and keeping your muscles strong is a way to help try to prolong that joint for as long as possible. Two more came through. After surgery, can a patient use assist assistive devices to perform lower extremity ADL, such as socks and shoes? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, after the surgery, there are a number of devices. Um, you know, the, the hospitals here have what's called a hip kit that people can purchase afterwards. I believe you can get them on Amazon as well. Um, and they have little devices inside there that do help people getting their socks and shoes on and things like that um, that can make life much easier in those first few weeks. Okay, and last question. Is it feasible to travel by car four to five hours after the surgery? So I usually recommend that long car rides, if possible, are avoided um, for the first six weeks after surgery uh, because there's going to be an elevated risk of blood clots after surgery. Um, and so the same thing with flying. I usually recommend that if someone can. Um, some people do come and um, travel from far away in order to have their operation. And, and when they do, frequently they're staying in a hotel or something nearby. And so I usually recommend for the first day or two, you know, just to hang out you know, there and then make the trip back. Um, and when they're making that trip back, I recommend every 45 minutes or so that they stop, get out of the car, walk around a little bit, again, just trying to keep that circulation going, then get back in the car and continue with the ride. Uh, we do have everyone on blood thinners after the operation. If most people are considered low risk, they're on a baby aspirin twice a day. If they're higher risk, we use stronger blood thinners, uh, but it'll be obviously crucial for that person traveling um, to, be, to be on a blood thinner. Thank you so much. Uh, question did come through. Do patients receive PT at home or outpatient at any point? So again, during that recovery, we'll see how someone's doing. You know, when I see people back in the office frequently, you know, they're hitting all of those milestones where they've transitioned from the walker to the cane, they've gotten rid of the cane, they're walking without a limp, they're back to their activities, they're happy. And so most people haven't required, you know, any therapy, whether in home or outpatient. Um, occasionally people do and sometimes you know we find that someone at you know six weeks is still you know struggling to get off their walker and we say okay let's let's start some therapy let's start you know working and guiding towards that um, and so you know at those times we then can focus the therapy uh, to help that person um, but for for most people no we don't we haven't found that they require it all right thank you dr sizer for taking the time to be here today um, I just want to remind everybody of the VIP line. Um, if you need to make an appointment with Dr. Sizer, he sees patients out of Malvern or Lincoln All. And that phone number is 610-480-6584. Again, that's 610-480-6584. I am going to email this presentation out to everybody. Um, so if you have any other questions, feel free to shoot me a message. But you can give uh, that number. I put it in the chat box as well. You can give that number a call and schedule an appointment to talk about any personal um, questions that you may have. So thank you so much. And thanks again, Dr. Sizer. Absolutely. Thank you everybody for coming. Have a great day. Right, take care.